All right, so up to this point, we've talked about stress strain, we've talked about elastic properties, we've talked some about plastic properties, and now I wanna kind of talk about some of the miscellaneous and other uh, properties that we haven't touched on yet. So the first one I wanna talk about is something known as resilience. And as it says here, it's the capacity to absorb energy, but specifically absorb energy elastically. So we're talking about um, the in the elastic portion, that linear region that we talked about before the yield stress, um, the ability to store energy. And this is a stress drain plot like we've seen many times now. Um, and you know the units here are pas megapascals or pascals. Here it's unitless for strain. Um, and the interesting thing is that the energy uh, absorbed by a material is actually related to the area underneath the curve. And so the resilience, this UR term, um, as you see here, is the integral um, from zero to the yield strain, so this point here, uh, with respect uh, to the stress uh, and strain. So basically, as you may be aware, the integral right will give you the area underneath the curve. And so because um, the units here are um, in units of stress and then unitless, it still ends up being pascals or megapascals. Um, however, we can also, if you go through and look at the pascal unit, you can rearrange that. And that's the same as a joule, which is energy units, per volume. So a pascal is the same as joule per volume. So that's kind of where this comes from. And the uh, area underneath the curve is defined as that energy. Um, and so the more area underneath the curve, the more elastic energy that it can absorb um, in, in that case. We can also simplify this, right? So if this is, uh, if the, the yield strength um, and everything below it is assumed linear, right? So again, there's this tiny portion that's not linear, but if we kind of assume it's linear, then we basically have a triangle here, right? You can kind of see it's um, um, uh, estimated here as a triangle, and there's a tiny portion that's obviously gonna be uh, not part of that. But if we do that, uh, actually we can simplify this uh, using that um, as our resilience, and we can basically uh, get that the resilience is equal to the yield strength squared divided by two times the elastic modulus. But So basically that's kind of using this as a triangle. Um, and so that's kind of the interesting thing about this. But this is, again, area underneath the curve is energy, and if we're only talking about the elastic portion, we're talking about resilience. So that's something important to think about is the area underneath the stress strain curve. Connected with that idea, we also have the concept of toughness. So you might have heard this uh, term toughness when talking about materials. So I kind of want to define it for you. So it's still related to energy that something can absorb, much like resilience. But in this case, instead of uh, elastic energy, we're talking about all energy up to the point of fracture. So if you're talking about something with like a ceramic that doesn't have a plastic region, then toughness and resilience end up being the same thing, right? Because there's no plastic uh, energy, there's only the elastic portion. And so that would be resilience like we saw in the previous screen here. So those are the same thing. However, something like uh, metal and polymers tend to have a lot of plastic um, elongation. And so the toughness, because it's defined as up to fracture, we have all this extra energy uh, to, to fracture that material because it can take so much plastic energy. Um, and so kind of uh, thinking about this logic then, a ceramic, which has very little plastic deformation, uh, but high strength, as you can see here, but still the area here is relatively small because it's high strength but low plastic deformation. And a polymer has low strength, but tends to have a lot of plastic deformation. So it also has um, low toughness. However, metals tend to have kind of intermediate strengths and intermediate elongations. And so that mixture optimizes the area underneath the curve. 
And so that's again what what we're doing here. So um, so yeah, so a tough material you know must be both strong and ductile, and the best ones are, are a, a, a good combination uh, of both. So just a little bit on this, more on this toughness. This concept of toughness, uh, you might imagine, is important if you're thinking of things that need to absorb energy uh, to as part of their material design. And so a couple examples of that: bulletproof glass, um, the plastic that makes up um, goggles, right? Things like that, where the whole idea is to protect the the thing behind that material, right? And a lot of times we don't care if that material fractures, right? If a bulletproof uh, glass piece shatter, uh, fractures, as long as it absorbs all that energy of that bullet before it reaches whatever is behind, we take that compromise, right? And so that's basically what toughness is. It's looking at how much energy, how much can that material take before it fractures? And so that's what we want in something like a helmet or goggles or bulletproof glass, right? All of those things, uh, we want a combination of strength um, and ductility to have those. All right, so the next thing I wanna talk about has to do with the way we define stress and strain. So all of the stress strain curves that we've looked at so far are what we call engineering, right? And we said, you know, we said that those definitions relied on the original area for stress and the original length for strain, right? But as you may be able to guess, if we define it by original, um, there's also other ways to do it. Uh, and that's to use the instantaneous length and area to define stress and strain. And so this is what we term true stress and true strain. Because, you know, if we're only measuring the original length and the original area, those two parameters change during a tensile test or during a compression test, right? And so it doesn't represent the material at that current state. And so if we do it uh, in terms of true stress, true strain, this gives us a different view of the material. It compensates for the uh, changes in area that happen during plastic deformation and necking. And it gives us uh, a true look, uh, for example, with length as well. Um, and so they're defined, uh, true stress is gonna be the force over the instantaneous area. Um, and if you're wondering, you know, this is a, a true way or a better way, well, one thing you have to keep in mind is that if you wanna measure true stress, you have to always know the area. And that's a difficult, uh, that's often difficult to do because you have to constantly measure the sample during a test. So it's basically the equivalent of having to constantly use your calipers on the sample while you run the test. And so that's not always practical. Uh, so that's why we tend to use engineering stress strain. Okay, so back to the true strain then. So true strain, um, epsilon t is then the defined as the natural log of the instantaneous length over the original length. And uh, one good thing that we can have, and, and another reason why engineering is often used, is because we can also convert from one to the other. So uh, true stress, we can convert from engineering stress uh, by looking at uh, that true stress, or sorry, the engineering stress multiplied by one plus the strain, engineering strain, and the true strain is natural log of one plus the engineering strain. However, these are only valid up until the onset of necking, which is the tensile strength, as you know from that module. So uh, after that, when we have the non-uniform um, cross-sectional area, those equations are no longer valid. So that's another thing to keep in mind. So you can see here the difference uh, between engineering and true is that you notice in the true stress, true strain, the red curve here, you'll notice that the stress is always going up. Even after the, the point here where you, rec uh, you see as the tensile stress, you see it keeps going up. And that is because after the tensile stress, right, there's necking. And so there's a non-uniform 
area, cross-sectional area. And so that concentrates the stress on that neck. Right? So if we measure that as our instantaneous link, uh, area, then the stress continues to go up. But if we use the original area, which is much smaller, then it appears that our stress, true stress goes down, but in fact, it actually goes up. So it's all in how we define these things. So if we define it by true uh, stress, then it continues to go up and then engineering goes down. Another thing we have to keep in mind is in looking at the neck, um, that isn't a um, simple stress state at that point because of the curvature of the neck. And so there's actually a complex stress state in the reduced area after necking. And so to kind of cor even more correct for that, we see that it actually kind of goes down a, a little bit. So it gets really complicated when the neck develops in the material. Okay, so that's um, true stress, true strain. So this is kind of our, um, you know, engineering stress strain plot we're looking at. Um, and the one thing I want to look at here is we've been looking at these curves, but we really haven't talked much about what it means for the material. And so here I want to kind of compare two materials. This is the, the red one is kind of something that we've typically seen, right? The elastic region, the strain, um, then there's plastic and it changes its curvature, but it continues to go up. Um, and then we saw the unloading, right, where we get some elastic recovery. And then if you go back up, it um, continues to go along the uh, slope. Um, however, we can also envision a second type of material, the one in blue, where it yields. And instead of continually going up, it actually kind of goes flat. So let's view, let's think about these two materials for a second. So for the blue one, if it um, yields here, and it, um, this is flat, what that means is to continually plastically deform the material, we no longer have to put additional stress into the material, right? The stress is leveled out. And so we can maintain the same level of stress to continually move it, right? So the material is kind of steady state, right? Nothing's changing about it. And so that means that um, it's kind of maintaining its strength. The, so the, the yield strength is the same as the strength at fracture. However, for the red one, let's consider this now. So this is the yield strength here, and then we continually deform it. And you'll notice that the stress continually goes up. So it takes more and more stress to move it. And so this is a strengthening. If this uh, slope increases, it means that the material is actually strengthening or hardening. And so we, we uh, refer to this one as uh, strain hardened because in the process of straining it, we've, we're in fact strengthening it or hardening it. And so that's an interesting phenomenon. The act of testing this material has strengthened it. And so how we can kind of see this is, let's say again, at this point here, um, after straining it, we unload it and we uh, remove the force. And so it's going to go back to here. And if we load it again, it's going to follow this curve back up uh, until this point, And then it's going to yield again, right? And one thing to notice here is that, again, this is defined as the yield point or the yield strength. However, if you look at this yield point, it's much higher than this one. Right? So by testing this material, we've in fact changed the yield strength because by straining it, we've hardened it or strain hardened it. And so this is known as strain hardening. This is something that we're going to talk about next in the next chapter, specifically what's happening to the material causing it to get harder and harder as we test it. So that's going to be basically the whole theme of the next chapter. So I'll kind of leave it um, at that. But just keep in mind that if this slope goes up, it means that we're hardening the material. And we can kind of fit that slope uh, in the true stress, true strain, uh, by this exponential equation, uh, where we have the true stress is equal to this uh, exponential uh, k here, and then the uh, true strain uh, to an exponent n. And so n is typically 0.15 for steels and 0.5 for coppers. So let's look at the next um, slide here and kind of look at that equation again. So the important parameter here is the n because that controls the slope of this exponential function 
that's defining this plastic region. So we're kind of trying to model the plastic region. And so this is an empirical equation that does so. So what this means um, is a zero for n uh, indicates that there's no strain hardening. So basically zero is this curve here. This is n equals zero. And anything above zero indicates that the stress increases during plastic deformation or we have strain hardening. And the more that it does, the bigger this number is, the more hardenable or stronger it can get and the higher the slope is. So things like copper and stainless steel have a very high ability to become hardened by strain hardening. Um, so basically that slope is higher and higher, right? So the yield strength, basically what that says is the yield strength starts out low, but can be increased quite a bit during plastic deformation. Whereas something like this magnesium alloy um, or this other type of steel 4340, right, doesn't have the same type of slope. And so it can't be strained hardened quite as much. So that's kind of the importance of this and the strain hardening equation because it models that plastic deformation region and tells us about the ability to strain harden.